Okay, we continue in our series of More Perfect You, The Pursuit of Perfection in Christ. This is lesson number three, and the title of this lesson is The Holy Spirit and Perfection. So in our, in our lesson so far, we have discussed the two concepts of perfection and how they are related to each other. This study is based on uh, the title, A More Perfect You, and I, I explained the title referred to the two types of perfection and how each of these affected our lives. Just a little review of that. First, conditional perfection, referred to as justification or salvation or righteousness or holiness. The Bible refers to this uh, conditional perfection in a variety of ways. This is the state of perfection given to us by God based on our faith in Christ. It happens at baptism. It is a perfection that is the same in quality as the perfection Christ attained through perfect obedience, and that's the point. What we could not do physically, emotionally, spiritually, what we could not do, attain perfection through obedience to the law, Christ has done. He's done that, and He has offered that perfect life for us in order to gain for us this conditional uh, perfection. It is the standard that we will be judged by. God, in judgment, will look at our conditional perfection and accept us because of it. And it's an awesome thing to think that God is going to judge us according to a perfect law. Now, it is the status that enables us to approach God now with confidence in prayer and in worship. It is the status that gives us the courage to try to serve and please God with our, you know, our puny efforts uh, here uh, by us you know, wrapped in this sinful flesh. The, uh, the promise of God in Christ is that one day we will shed our outer garment of imperfection and will actually be what we are only considered to be at the moment. So that's conditional perfection. Actual perfection. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Now conditional perfection is a status that we are given by God, a status that God sees when He views us, a status we will be uh, judged by. Actual perfection is what we and others actually see in us. Actual perfection is the status of perfection we actually achieve through the help of the Holy Spirit, through the help of God's word, through the help of the church and our own submission to these tutors and these enablers. Actual perfection is the way of life that we choose to pursue when we become Christians and receive that conditional perfection from God based on our faith in Christ. So we are considered perfect. This guarantees our salvation and our hope of heaven. Being this way, however, prompts us to pursue actual perfection as a lifestyle. So it would be ridiculous and foolish if one receives baptism, receives conditional perfection, and then goes back and pursues the imperfect lifestyle that originally condemned that person. That makes no sense. Now the, the only option available to the one considered perfect by God is to pursue actual perfection before men as a witness of faith and as an offering of thanks uh, to God. And so actual perfection is that state pursued by those already considered perfect by God through faith. For a uh, new Christian to do this would be frustrating, and or excuse me, for a non-Christian to do this would be frustrating and hypocritical because you know, perfection through human effort is impossible. But for the Christian, the conditionally perfect one, this is a valid lifestyle choice because it affords him an opportunity to achieve two goals. First of all, the pursuit of actual perfection is a powerful witness to those without Christ because it sets Christians apart from all others. It's a way of setting us apart from the world of sinners, you know, non-believers. And secondly, it's a wonderful instrument of praise because the effort involved honors God and signifies how strongly the Christian believes. I pursue actual perfection, not to save myself, I do that in order to say to God, 
I believe in order to say to God, I love you, in order to say to God, I want to serve you, that my faith is, is sincere and real. And therein lies the differences and purposes of these two ideas. So let's look now at how the Holy Spirit works in creating the state of conditional and actual perfection. So this section, the Holy Spirit and perfection. When you watch uh, certain programs, uh, certain religious uh, television, especially uh, religious television that involve big uh, showcases and singing and uh, you know, a, a kind of a show business type approach to, uh, to worship, what you're seeing is a kind of perversion of the work of the Holy Spirit by those who see it in human terms. For example, uh, Hollywood style spectacles using lights and sensual music, manipulative staging, uh, group hysteria tactics, emotional appeals, all of this done to uh, produce a, a spiritual experience which they claim is proof that the Holy Spirit is working and present in their ministries and their assemblies. You know, people jumping up and down, they're getting all hot and sweaty and bothered and hallelujahs and so on and so forth. And they're saying, you know, because I'm having this experience, it must mean that the Holy Spirit is active and, 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 and working, all right? Uh, we in the Churches of Christ are being affected by this because we want to have our churches become you know, exciting in worship. We want our people to feel something. We want to, to prove that we have the Holy Spirit in some recognizable way. Well, there's nothing, nothing wrong with being excited or feeling something because of our faith. I mean, there are legitimate spiritual desires that we have, and these are legitimate spiritual needs that we have. The problem arises when we try to manufacture these experiences through human, fleshly ways, rather than through spiritual, uh, biblical ways, and that's my, my point here. You know, much uh, of the efforts at changing worship styles you know, in, our, in many of our churches stems from the false notion that if we can create some kind of feeling at worship due to the music or the presentation or the introduction of new elements like drama or soloists or worship teams, whatever, then somehow we will be more spiritual and thus more satisfied spiritually. But the true results of this approach to heightened spirituality is twofold. First of all, a sense of elitism. People who manufacture spirituality in this way become like spiritual snobs. They begin to see their value as Christians rise because they have a superior spiritual level produced by their different worship styles. This of course leads to division because anyone who doesn't use their approach is somehow spiritually inferior. Now we see this happening in the Corinthian church for example, I mean, I'm using a biblical example here where the brethren were not manufacturing false spirituality, but they were misusing legitimate spiritual gifts. No matter, whenever spirituality is false or misused, division ensues. We see this happening in our own brotherhood today where labels like progressive and traditional are being attached to different churches. Is your church a traditional church? Or are you a progressive church? We never had that before. We never you know, put labels on ourselves like that before. When this happens, it's only a matter of one or more generation before there'll be a visible separation between those who ascribe to one view or the others. You know, the progressive churches will want to have a different name and identify themselves in a different way. Now it's a shame because both sides are right in a way and wrong in a way. For example, the progressives are right in that there needs to be a constant effort to make the faith relative to each new generation. They're wrong, however, in thinking that superficial changes, and in some cases, biblical changes, will address the need of the modern culture to know and experience God in Christ in a, at a deeper level. You don't experience Christ at a deeper level by adding instruments 
you know, to your musical program in worship. And yet some people think that that's going to make a huge spiritual difference. This is only possible you know, to deepen. This is only possible through the actual work of the Holy Spirit. Not stage techniques or multimedia shows. You know, that appeals to the desire to be entertained, to be visually and emotionally stimulated. Now the traditionals are correct in holding that any change that compromises scripture is dangerous and not worth the short-term gains. They're wrong, however, in their thinking that the way that they have culturally adapted New Testament worship and practice is the only way. Mm -hmm. You want to think the way we do it in our town and in our church is the only way that it needs to be done anywhere else and everywhere else. I've seen many different cultural groups, Asians, Africans, Caribbeans, whatever, adapt the practice of New Testament Christianity in ways that we here in North America would think strange, but are perfectly within biblical guidelines. You know, rigid traditionalism doesn't represent the Spirit's presence any more than progressive emotionalism does. You know, those who are strict traditionalists think that any change you know, is the loss of the spirit. And, it's the, other way. and you know, the progressives think the same thing. If you do anything different than they do, oh, the spirit's not there. And so manufactured spirituality leads to a kind of Christian elitism, which is most visible in our brotherhood in the you know, progressive traditional lives and lines of divisions being drawn these days. Unfortunate, but true. Uh, another result of manufactured spirituality, a loss of faith. What does the Bible say? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ, Paul says, Romans 10, 17. So if this spiritual principle is applied and extended, we can also say that loss of faith comes from hearing words that don't come from Christ. So if faith comes from hearing the words of Christ, the loss of faith comes from hearing the words of someone else and believing those. It's, uh, it's sad to note that those who pursue manufactured spirituality and create the elitism that seems to come with it also produce a lot of burned out souls. For example, and today we don't hear a whole lot about them, but there was a time back in the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, early 21st century, uh, the Boston movement, what we originally called the Boston movement or the International Churches of Christ movement, uh, whose spiritual elitism was based not on their worship style, but on their absolute narrow focus on personal discipling. And through this, they created incredible numbers of baptisms and large assemblies in arenas and schools, which they, they took great pride in. You know, baptizing you know, 100, 200, 300 people a year. And the question was always, so how many is your church baptizing? They took a great pride in their discipling ministry. But their manufactured spirituality also created the most serious division in our brotherhood in the last century. And in addition to this, what is rarely reported is the dropout rate of their numbers. Some estimates as high as 50 to 60 percent. In other words, they had to baptize you know, 10 people in order to keep three or four. And those who dropped out were not simply people who quit because they loved sin or they wanted to go back to the world. They were people, in the most part, who loved God, but were so emotionally scarred by their experience with these groups and cults and their cult-like methods that it took special counseling and years of healing, if ever at all, before they could feel anything except guilt and anger because in the international churches or Boston churches, you know, the focus was on evangelism. And the method was control. You know, one person controlled one other person and one person over here controlled a group of 10 and another person controlled a group of 100 and it, it worked its way up. And then you had just a few people at the top that controlled everything, not just in one congregation, but in the entire 
you know, in that entire movement. So manufactured spirituality is dangerous because it has power without any of the edifying qualities of true spirituality. You know, the result of that cult-like controlled environment that produced a lot of baptism was people who were not you know, experiencing the peace that surpasses understanding. We're not experiencing a greater ability at, 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 at humility, at meekness, gentleness, kindness. It was a very aggressive type of spirituality that, that they embodied. So we don't see it much yet, but the phenomena that takes place in many Pentecostal and charismatic churches will begin to creep in our progressive type churches in our brotherhood as well. So you know, I'm, I'm talking about the Boston movement whose movement kind of came and went and did its damage. And, and the movements that are now taking place in our brotherhood are the progressive versus traditionalist. That's, that's what's happening nowadays. And it centers mainly around, around our worship style. In the charismatic movement, uh, there is a constant drive for greater and greater stimulation in order to get that spiritual fix that everybody desires. So services get longer and more numerous, worship becomes more elaborate, more outlandish, bands and plays and pageants and parades. Eventually there's nowhere else to go emotionally. It's no wonder that, and I make this a personal observation here, it's no wonder that a majority of blues and jazz and pop singers in the United States learn their style and craft in churches. And these people, many of them, left the churches because it was a, you know, a non-paying type of show business. And they could do the exact same thing in show business, but get paid for it. But members leave also because they are burned out emotionally. The manufactured spirit can bring them no higher, so they, they quit. So those congregations in our brotherhood who think that they are so far ahead because of their you know, progressive brand of worship don't realize that others have blazed this trail before and found that it was a total dead end spiritually. It takes some time, but eventually it doesn't work. So if the spiritual experience that you crave or are having has not been created by the Holy Spirit, then your religious feeling is illegitimate and it can lead you to pride or worse still, loss of faith. What is truly sad is that in the Bible, worship to God did not create a feeling. Worship to God was offered because the feeling was already there. You know, people who come to worship looking for an experience or feeling are looking for the wrong thing. That's not to say that there are not feelings and experiences that come from our worship, but this isn't the reason to come to worship. That's my point. You may think I've kind of wandered off here, but I haven't. The original point was the relationship between the Holy Spirit and perfection. So here's the point. Legitimate spiritual feelings and experiences within the Christian life are generated by the Holy Spirit in the Christian as he or she receives conditional perfection and pursues actual perfection. In other words, being considered perfect by God in Christ, the knowledge of and the contemplation of and the sharing of this priceless gift this is what gives rise to the experience of gratitude. This is what gives rise to the feeling of peace, the emotion of happiness. These are the legitimate feelings of the truly spiritual person. I'm not excited and hot and sweaty. I'm at peace. I feel a deeper sense of gratitude, an ongoing sense of gratitude. I'm emotionally a happier person, and not because of material things, but because what the Spirit has given me through Christ. 
These are produced by the knowledge of and the response to the gospel of Christ, which is spread by the power and the agency of the Holy Spirit. So no music or light show or group or show or spectacle or huge crowd can manufacture within me the feelings produced in myself by the cross of Christ. And from the beginning of time, the Holy Spirit has worked in concert with the Father and the Son to not only make the cross happen, but to guarantee that the good news of the cross be spread throughout the world. Very important, not only for salvation's sake, of course, but for all the feelings that salvation brings and engenders in a person. And so the spiritual experience evoked in me by the cross and what it has done for me is timeless and it's limitless. For example, it humbles me rather than puffs me up. I mean, if, if the experience of the cross of Christ and being saved through it makes you proud, there's something you haven't, you know, you, you haven't grasped here. It's exactly the opposite. The greater understanding I have of what Christ has done for me generates in me a sense of humility, not pride. It, it also joins me to all other believers rather than separates me. Where there's argument and division, you know, that's not where the spirit is. The spirit is where there is unity and peace. The knowledge of all of this offers an endless capacity for my joy and my thankfulness and my pleasure. Have you, have you not ever had a, a session of prayer uh, you know, personal private prayer, where all you have done is to give thanks? If you haven't, try that. Say to yourself, I, I'm going to you know, shut off the phone and turn off the tablet, whatever, and I, I'm going to go into prayer, and all I'm going to do is give thanks. And I'll start with some simple obvious things. You know, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm able to breathe, and I, you know, I've got a home, and I have a job. You know, just be thankful for those things and, and, and ask God to lead you in that prayer and show you some of the things that you need to be thankful for. I mean, it's endless. You, you won't be able to get to the end of the prayer because there are so many things you know, to give thankful for, to give thanks for, excuse me. And also all of this information, this news, this knowledge renews my faith with every reminder of it. That's why I, try to set aside to pray every day, because every day I'm reminded of what God has done for me, especially through the cross of Christ. Now, in addition to all of this, pursuing actual perfection, and we're getting back to you know, our original you know, ideas here, conditional perfection, actual perfection. So pursuing actual perfection as my goal in life brings harmony into my life. Harmony between myself and God as I strive to please Him. Harmony between my conscience and myself, knowing that I am right because of conditional perfection and I pursue right by pursuing actual perfection. The knowledge of one and the pursuit of the other brings great peace and harmony to our souls. And also it brings greater harmony between others and myself in that I now seek for peace, I now bring the good news, I now am salt and light and no longer walk in the darkness. The pursuit of actual perfection produces all of these things in my life. Also this pursuit of actual perfection creates a harmony that results in what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. You know, things about me that are a cause for joy and peace and love and other good things that, I, that not only I experience, but others can see and experience also because of me. Another benefit. And so through the work of the Holy Spirit, helping to produce these things in me, I become a channel of God's blessings for other people. 
I become a conduit for spiritual feelings that others can experience. Have you, have you never been in the presence of a person who is truly at peace with themselves, whose conscience is clear, who's full of the Spirit, full of the fruit of the Spirit? Have you never been you know, in the presence of a person like that? And, and, and how their influence on you it calms you, brings out the best in you, makes you want to pursue what is right and good? Yeah, the pursuit of actual perfection produces not only something in you, but it also produces something in others who witness what is happening in you. So this is the way that Christians begin to experience God and share that experience with other people. Worship, true worship, takes place when individual Christians who experience God legitimately in this way come together and they infuse their singing and their praying and their fellowship and their communion and their preaching and their giving and their service with the spiritual feelings that perfection in Christ has produced in them. You don't go to church to get these things, you bring these things to church and share them in public worship. When these things happen, there is no more progressives or traditionalists. All are one in the spirit and there is no pride and there is no division there is no loss of faith, but rather the building up of the body in love. Every time you distinguish yourself, you know, that, isn't, uh, that isn't of love. And so this is the relationship between the Holy Spirit, perfection, and our experience of true spirituality as a church. The Spirit is the one that produces that fruit. The Spirit is the one that helps us in our pursuit of actual perfection. The Spirit is the one that brings us together in this common pursuit, this common experience, this common joy, this common acceptable worship that we are able to offer to God. Why? Because of what the Spirit is accomplishing in each individual Christian as he or she pursues that actual grace with the confidence, uh, excuse me, that actual perfection, with the confidence of knowing that they have the conditional perfection that God has bestowed upon them through Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, next time we will, uh, we'll, I've talked about getting into the text. Next time I promise we'll get into the text in our, in our next lesson. That's it for this time. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. We'll see you next week.